Okay, y'all know the drill by now. A lot of games came out this year, and I have seen all of them. Yes, all of them. Don't question me. Some of those games had some amazing animation in them, and I want you to know about it. So, here is a list of some of my favorite game animation I saw in 2022. And it seemed like that categories thing worked pretty good last year. Let's do that again. First up... Seems an appropriate place to start. It's where all animation started, if you think about it. And if 2D is good enough for Emile's Renault and Cole, it's good enough for us. Sorry, that joke was for, like, me and maybe eight other people watching this. They loved it, though. The stylistic variety of 2D games that just dropped on us in a single year is a heck of a thing. There was that children's book illustration aesthetic of The Cruel King and The Great Hero. We got some cartoony antics with Blast Brigade. We got this wonderfully comfy bubblegum vibe from Melatonin, who thought that they could release a game in the last two weeks of December and sneak it past me, the fools. And we got this incredible period look from Card Shark. But strewn amongst this absolute buffet of cool aesthetics, there were a couple of games with animation that really deserves special mention. One of them was Cult of the Lamb. The dissonant combination of unsettling subject matter and cute art style has been done before, plenty of times. But this game's execution on that combo is one of the best I've seen, to the point that they are able to swing between the extremes of cutesy and disturbing in a blink without ever compromising on either element. And the game's bouncy, expressive animation plays a big role in stabilizing this mixture. Your lamb's motion is pitch perfect. From the springiness of their run, to the cheerfully sinister expressions on their face, to the satisfying snappiness of their attacks, even just the sweet little sway of their idol. But it's not just your lamb, you can see that polish everywhere. Your followers, your enemies, the environment, every little detail has been so carefully considered and the result is just gorgeous. My undying compliments to the team at Massive Monster. I'm going to have to start paying closer attention to y'all from now on. But there is no way we are leaving the 2D category behind until we talk about Cuphead, the delicious last course. Sometimes more of the same is the best possible thing you could hope for. Cuphead was a singular event in game animation history, a game which imitated the look of 1930s American animation and did so with a level of care and stylistic authenticity that no one else has ever attempted and no one else will probably ever top. I mean, hand-drawn and inked animations on actual paper, layered over real watercolor-painted background art, all of this set to live recorded big band music. There is nothing else like it. And now, the delicious last course is just giving us more. The animation is just as delightful as before, beautifully imitating the timing, spacing, and unique style of exaggeration that makes that rubber hose era of American animation so distinctly recognizable. I am still garbage at the game, but that's okay. I am just glad we all get to enjoy a little more of this wonderfully unique thing. And speaking of games which adopt the aesthetics of earlier technological eras, let's move on to... Even within the medium of pixel animation, itself a subcategory of 2D animation when you get down to it, there is so much interesting aesthetic range being thrown at us all the time. In 2022 alone, we got the 8-bit inspired style of Infernax, paying homage to Castlevania with a few extra gory flourishes sprinkled on top. We got Soldiers, looking like a lovingly thorough remaster of some PS1 classic that never existed but should have. We got Moonscars, a gorgeously bleak production with player movement and attacks that have all of the fluid detail of rotoscoped work but with none of its sluggishness. These moves are quick and responsive and, mm, very good. And speaking of snappy attacks, we also got Jack Move, a turn-based RPG with some great style and what might be one of my favorite basic attack animations of the year. Just look at this punch. Bam! Satisfying. But there were a few particular high points that I want to call attention to, even more so because one of them tried real hard to evade my notice. River City Girls 2. Again, the nerve of these people, releasing their game on the 16th of December. Thought I'd be too distracted trying to get this video finished to notice, did you? Well, your game's animation's great, and I saw it, so... Ha! I sang the original game's praises in 2019, and this sequel's animation is just as fun. All of those inventive movesets are still here, now with more playable characters and a bunch of new enemies just piling on more animated personality by the truckload. Still the best animation the Kunio-kun series has ever had. 
And hey, if you want to see even more from this game's animation director, he also somehow found time to make a Vampire Survivors-like Hololive fan game this year, just for fun. And it turns out it's actually really good, so maybe give that a look too. But now that River City Girls has officially failed its stealth check, I am ready to talk about Cursed to Golf. Cursed to Golf is not like a lot of the pixel animation games I highlight here. It is not filled to bursting with flashy animation that is demanding your full attention at all times. This animation knows when to get out of the way. And that's for the best. You are playing high-stakes purgatory golf. You have bigger concerns. Instead, the animation fills the cracks, and it consistently does so with so much charm and appeal. The way you respawn teleport to your ball in a variety of silly ways, this absolutely beautiful ledge teeter, the bounce on your little golf cart. The animation in this game just wants to give you a little smile in between those tense rounds of roguelike golf for dead people, and it does so beautifully. But when it comes to pixel animation games making you smile, well, this year it's pretty hard to top Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. Using animation to create contrast between character personalities is always important, but when your main cast already looks like palette-swapped versions of each other, that need for characterization contrast becomes absolutely critical. And the animators on this game have risen to that challenge. Just look at how distinct and character-appropriate those runs feel. The amount of animated appeal coming off of this game is higher than any previous TMNT game has ever managed, which is no small feat. I mean, sure, this game is clearly setting out to deliver a weapons-grade potency of nostalgia for those old 8 and 16-bit turtle beat-em-ups, but the amount of animated charm it delivers while doing so is not a product of mere nostalgia. That is just some quality animation work. Every part of this game is engineered to delight, animation included, and it succeeds. 10 out of 10. No notes. But speaking of delightful weirdos, let's move on to our next category. Some games simply refuse to neatly fit into one of my little categories, but we shan't hold that against them. And there were quite a few more vying for a spot in my list this year. Tinykin, for example, is a wonderful little Pikmin-y platformer with a 2D-3D hybrid look that is just delightful. And I don't think I have ever seen a game commit so hard to an aesthetic concept as RPG Time The Legend of Right. I mean, look at this thing. Bonkers. But while both of these games have some very good animation that achieves everything it needs to within each respective game's chosen aesthetic, neither of them deliver on animated personality quite like Young Souls. It was, apparently, a very good year for well-animated beat-em-up games, but I can't think of another game that looks quite like this one, and certainly not with this much style. Or character. Just a couple minutes after hitting start, I already adored these twins, largely thanks to just how very expressive they are. I love how stylistically distinct this game looks in motion. The dynamic pose work, the snappy timing. For such a small team, one-player, two-player studios sure have managed to make this 2D, 3D hybrid look good. Another little studio I apparently need to start watching more closely. If you are into the idea of a co-op beat-em-up with a chip on its shoulder, a slightly more serious tone, and personality to spare, Young Souls will deliver. But okay, enough dabbling in 3D, let's go ahead and dive all the way in. Because we have got a lot to talk about. And let's go ahead and start with the heavy hitters, the triplest of the A's. Because every year brings us a bunch of new, big-budget games vying for the throne of most high-fidelity, realistically rendered human character animation. This year, we saw a very impressive showing from Asobo with A Plague Tale Requiem, and the remake of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 showcased some more impressive pre-rendered work from Blur Studios, and their in-engine stuff was certainly no slouch either. It never is. But in 2022, it is pretty hard to top Striking Distance Studios' in-engine results in the Callisto Protocol. The thing about attempting photorealistic human animation is that it's not just an animation challenge. Animation like this is a true multidisciplinary feat. Because you can capture an actor's physical and facial performance and polish that animation data to a near-perfect recreation of reality, but without good lighting and good shader work, without skin that reacts to light or creases in just the right ways, without eyelids that deform in just the right way as the pupil moves beneath them, without all that extremely good technical artistry from very skilled specialists, the whole thing can break at any moment. 
and the results this team has managed in these cinematics, in real-time cinematics no less, are quite impressive. Of course, when your goal is to present a perfectly real-looking CG human, no matter how skilled the artists or impressive the tech, there is still no avoiding the uncanny. Fortunately, that doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Which brings us to the quarry. Supermassive Games has been delivering some really impressive work with the Dark Pictures anthology, and it's frankly silly that I haven't given that work a mention in these annual roundups sooner. Now, these games are not going to fool you into thinking you are looking at live actors filmed on a set. I mean, neither are Callisto Protocol or Call of Duty, that's not my point. I'm saying that in Supermassive's genre horror games, it doesn't matter that the characters look a little uncanny, because the uncanny is what these games thrive on. As I said in 2019 of Remedy's work in Control, when the entire vibe of the game is off-kilter by design, a realistic human character feeling slightly unsettling only feeds into that vibe. These actors are delivering some fantastic genre acting. The lighting and cinematography are on point. It is just effective work from a studio that has gotten very good at turning limitations to their advantage. Naturalistic 3D animation doesn't have to look as expensive as possible to be great, and to further demonstrate that fact, let's talk about Sifu. So many games have taken influence from martial arts films over the decades, but I've never played a game that actually felt so much like one. And not because it replicates the aesthetic or fighting styles, although this game certainly does those things too, but because it captures the moment-to-moment -moment narrative of combat choreography in those films. The precisely tuned flow of picking apart a wave of oncoming attackers one after another. The rapid succession of problem, solution, problem, solution. The importance of improvisation, and the ways that the environment shapes every encounter and offers unique solutions to that non-stop barrage of new threats. The animation on all of these moves looks great. The mocap has been pushed and exaggerated in all of the right ways to sell the speed of these actions without losing that sense of grounded physicality, and they've done some really fantastic cinematography work using the gameplay camera to frame the action and emphasize impacts. This is the kind of game that relies on effective animation to even work, and fortunately, Sifu's animation achieves everything this game needs to thrive. Just because your game's animation style is grounded in realistic physicality doesn't mean there isn't room for a little exaggeration, or even stylistic flair. And few games in 2022 demonstrated that better than God of War Ragnarok. To literally no one's surprise, this game's animation rocks, and in all of the same ways I already covered with its predecessor. The gameplay animation is just as satisfying and attentive to character and terrifyingly polished, and the cinematic work is just as thoughtfully delivered. Whether it's a moment of quiet tension, or loud spectacle, or intimate vulnerability, these performers are putting in some fantastic work. And this animation team, which is packed with some of the most skilled artists and engineers in this entire industry, is delivering at 100% of their potential. It is incredible to behold. In any given moment, whether you're in a story scene or in the thick of gameplay, these characters are so fully realized and sincerely performed and cohesively presented. The fact that any of us are finding ourselves emotionally invested in God of War characters is a real achievement by a lot of people. Sony Santa Monica remains a force to be reckoned with, and I'm not seeing any signs of that changing. But while we are on the subject of studios being very good at what they do, Let's talk about Elden Ring. You know what I love about From Software's animators? They always know exactly where the animation budget needs to go. As I have said in previous videos, FromSoft games rarely feature the most polished or expensive looking animation in the AAA space. There are always some rough edges here and there. I mean, they only just recently started actually animating NPCs' mouths when they talk in conversation. And that still doesn't look very good. But that's okay, because this animation team knows where the time and money needed to go. And because of that, the animation in Elden Ring is able to achieve what it really needs to, which is combat clarity and tone. The gameplay animation in Elden Ring is functionally superb. This studio has gotten so good at designing enemy movesets and animating clearly telegraphed attacks that it's astonishingly rare to find examples of enemies that feel completely unreadable in an unfair-feeling way. 
These boss move sets are some of their most impressive work yet, and the cinematics preceding some of these fights are some of the most unsettling, spectacular, and wonderfully weird things I have seen all year. FromSoft may have quite a few imitators these days, but none of them has ever been so brazen as to have one of their biggest spectacle set-piece bosses they have ever made spend the entire battle riding a tiny horse. I don't know how this team manages to balance their unique blend of horror, grandeur, melancholy, and comedy so effectively, but I love them for it. FromSoft's animation team always knows where to put their budget, and it's a good thing they do, because their games would absolutely fall to pieces otherwise. I can't wait to see more. Speaking of things falling to pieces, though, did y'all play Aperture Desk Job? It was basically a tech demo for Valve's new Steam Deck, but even if you don't have one, this little game is worth your time anyway, just for the delight of seeing Valve's animators deliver yet another perfect comedy robot. GLaDOS and Wheatley were both fantastic demonstrations of how much personality you can convey with only a few moving parts. And now Grady is here to continue this tradition of Portal games having some of the best animated comedic delivery in all of video games. He is basically an eyeball and one arm, and a bunch of great line reads from Nate Bargatze, and that's all these animators need. Man, I hope Valve does more with Portal. Even just a tech demo in this setting is such a special treat. But while we're on the subject of robots, Horizon Forbidden West. I started this channel one year too late to compliment the animation in Horizon Zero Dawn, so it was real nice of Guerrilla Games to go back and make another one just for me. You are going to spend so much time fighting robot animals in Horizon games that those animals better look good. And boy do they. A lot of the animators on this project have actually posted reels of their work here on YouTube. You're looking at some of that right now. And I recommend looking those up just to appreciate some of the great work being done here. But the human animation has seen some improvements too. The first Horizon game made use of a Bioware-style modular conversation animation system to handle the enormous quantity of dialogue exchanges, and that worked quite well. But when they dropped that in the Frozen Wilds DLC and instead switched to using performance capture for every branch of every conversation, the difference was huge. Seeing every little exchange performed by an actor making specific acting choices for each line, seeing these characters thinking and listening and reacting to each other as they talk, it was a major improvement. But I was curious if they'd be able to expand that bespoke treatment to a full-size game, and it turns out, yes, they can. Congrats to the team at Guerrilla for managing to push animation that was already looking great even further. Speaking of games with good creature animation, though, they went and released another dang Monster Hunter this year, didn't they? Okay, it's an expansion, but still. Hey, Capcom, can you give me like one year off from having to come up with new ways to say Monster Hunter's animation is good? Because I'm running out of new ways to say the same nice things. Can I just can I copy paste some of the nice things I said before? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. <clears throat> Monster Hunter has always had some of the most inventive and appealing looking boss creature animation in the business. These are games which invite you to study and internalize each monster's body language to improve, and that can only work because of how carefully tuned the animations on these creatures are. Additionally, the weighty, expressive attack combo work for every weapon type remains phenomenal, and the fact that these games deliver on this much functional style, while also offering dozens of little, goofy, completely unnecessary touches like these, will never stop delighting me. Also, cats still make you food. Why are the rest of the games not doing this yet? Uh, did Capcom pull a Warner Brothers and patent it or something? But every game needs this, and until every game has it, Monster Hunter's going to keep winning Game Animation of the Year by default. Cat made food, contest over. But while we are on the subject of cats, there is one more game in this category which I absolutely must talk to you about, and that is Stray. I don't know if I have ever seen such a clear-cut example of animation selling a game. This is a game from a small team, and as such, there are places where the animation might have a rough edge or two, but it doesn't matter, even a little bit, because the animation on this cat is so well-observed and so authentic-feeling that cat lovers took notice and the game kinda blew up. There are a lot of other games that have cats in them, but surprisingly few of them actually attempt to animate real cat behavior. We don't tend to animate cats as they are. We animate the idea of cats, the human personalities we've collectively projected onto cats over the years. 
but this game tries to capture the real thing, to present how a cat actually moves and communicates, from the fundamentals of its body mechanics to the subtleties of how it expresses with its tail. Real cat behavior can be pretty inscrutable unless you are really familiar with the animals, and it is abundantly clear that these animators are. And that authenticity resonated. The simple novelty of playing as a cat who actually feels like a cat had enormous appeal, it turns out. And there might be a valuable lesson in that. I can think of quite a few animals that are widely beloved but rarely presented with this level of care when we make them a game's primary focus. It could be there are some very large potential audiences we've been ignoring. A huge congrats to Blue 12 Studio for your success with this one. You gave us something we did not realize we were craving, and that's a pretty rare feat. But at last, it is time for our final category. You could not turn in any direction in 2022 without some colorful game trying to charm you and succeeding. Kirby and the Forgotten Land has some of the cutest Kirby animation you have seen and some of the wildest Kirby animation you have ever seen. I don't know how to put to words the delighted trepidation I would feel every time I encountered an object with this prompt. I can't decide if I'm happy about this, but I am smiling, so your guess is as good as mine. But then, on the only slightly more realistic side of the stylization spectrum, you've also got Bayonetta 3, serving up some absurdly stylish combat with all of the inimitable flair Bayonetta has taught us to expect. Meanwhile, back in Cartoon Land, the player character in Time on Frog Island has probably my favorite run animation of the year. It has this wonderfully bouncy quality that also feels tightly wound in a way that I just love. You know you're looking at some good animation when a basic run is enough to make you smile. But if we're going to talk about animation that makes you smile, then I've got to give some special recognition to Trombone Champ. Yes, I am 100% serious when I say that Trombone Champ's animation is great. Simple, yes, but also, just like the animation in Say No More and Untitled Goose Game before it, a vital ingredient to this game's comedy. The awkward toots and blats of your trombone are already very funny, whether you are playing well or not. The silly art and background elements behind the note track of each song amplify that comedy. But the piece that puts this all over the top is your happy little performer over there to the right, dynamically following the rise and fall of your off-key notes, swaying with enthusiastic, defiant glee all the while. This animated depiction of your very bad brass solo completes the joke Trombone Champ is telling, and any animation that can successfully pull that much weight in an experience deserves recognition. But as long as we are recognizing excellence, let's just go ahead and give Arc System Works their annual trophy for DNF Duel. I have spent a lot of words praising this team over the years, so I'm going to try to make this quick. Arc System Works figured out the precise alchemy required to pull off this incredibly convincing anime look with Guilty Gear XR almost a decade ago now, and they have been tricking people into thinking they were looking at hand-drawn sprites ever since. DNF Duel continues this tradition with yet another payload of fighting game animation that is just a feast for the eyes. Of course, I wouldn't go so far as to call this an escalation over their previous offerings. The style's a little more stripped down and simple this time around. Not too far off from the look of Guilty Gear XR, actually, but the magic trick still works. So I guess Arxis will have to settle for merely continuing to do better at this than literally anyone else in the industry. But speaking of fighting game animation that deserves some kudos, Multiverses. In past videos, I have stated that a character's animated incarnation in a Smash Brothers game should be a nostalgic celebration of that character's history, capturing the essence of that character, making them feel instantly familiar. Now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Multiverses is better at this than Smash Brothers, because some characters are translated and executed on more successfully than others, I think, but there is some real great stuff in here, including one of the most inventive character movesets I have ever seen. You can play as Tom and Jerry in this game, and most of their attacks involve Tom either trying to put Jerry in harm's way or taking a swing at Jerry and missing, hitting your opponent instead. And that is a real clever idea, very well executed. I can think of no better way to instantly convey what Tom and Jerry are about as a duo. And this bit of brilliance is enough to ensure that I am going to be checking in on multiverses from now on just to see what new characters are looking like. Very well done. But let's shift focus to other battle mice in Moss Book 2. 
This is the best little mouse you're going to find in video games, and she first appeared in what ended up being one of the best animated games of 2018. Well, I am happy to report that the animation in this sequel looks every bit as good as the first. The way these little rodents scramble and throw all of their tiny weight into their actions does so much to preserve an appropriate sense of scale in this world. Richard Lico and his team have done wonderful work here. In fact, if you are curious to see what animating a character like Quill looks like, Lico actually posted a video demonstrating his animation process a while back, and it's a great little 101 level introduction to animating a 3D character using his kind of unusual but very effective workflow. I'll link it down below, and I recommend giving it a look. It's pretty great seeing an industry veteran opting to freely share some of his knowledge and experience. Wait, that just reminded me? Okay, now we're gonna talk about Masahiro Sakurai's YouTube channel. Yes, I know it's not a game, who cares? So, Masahiro Sakurai, creator of Kirby and director of the Smash Brothers series, made a YouTube channel this year, and has spent the last several months using it to teach the basics of game development, just brain dumping all of the knowledge he has accrued over the decades in high quality, easily digestible, beginner-friendly videos posted publicly for free where they can be accessed by as many people as possible, seemingly just because he feels like it. This is a wonderful thing, and it should become a trend. Of course, I know better than most that it takes a lot of time and a non-zero amount of money to create this kind of thing, which is why you don't see a ton of individual game dev veterans opting to tackle this sort of project. But they shouldn't have to. Game studios everywhere should be funding little internal projects like this, especially the big studios who have the resources to spare and a lot of veterans on staff with a wealth of experience and knowledge to share. Heck, if you're wanting to get that kind of initiative started where you work, I will help you. Just reach out to me. I would love to help make there be more things like what Sakurai-san has created here. If you haven't already, go subscribe to his channel. It is a wonderful initiative from an industry legend who has a lot of valuable knowledge to share. Anyway, speaking of... Uh, some kind of Nintendo-based segue? Mario plus Rabbids, Sparks of Hope. It has been really fun to see Mario characters put into the hands of more animation teams outside of Nintendo, because you can always feel that team's unique fingerprints and stylistic sensibilities on the resulting work. And Ubisoft's Mario plus Rabbids crossovers have been an especially delightful blend. I love how the Mario characters look in these games. Their motion is a little bit looser, a little squishier, more exaggerated, but not so exaggerated that it stops feeling like a Mario character. It honestly looks great on them. And the Rabbids have always had some of the best goofball slapstick animation in gaming, so of course they still look great. We don't see a whole lot of this extra cartoony 3D animation work in this medium, so games like Mario Plus Rabbids are a pretty special treat. Kudos to the teams at Ubisoft Milan and Paris for their work here. But this wasn't the only top-tier showcase of Mario Animation 2022 gave us, because we also got Mario Strikers Battle League. This YouTube channel began with me singing the praises of Next Level Games' animation team, and for good reason. They are extremely good at animating Nintendo's core roster of characters. These animators have not missed a single opportunity to squeeze character into every action, even the ones that are likely going to go unnoticed in the chaos of play. I am constantly spotting all of these little character touches, and I'm reasonably certain that distraction is causing me to lose more often, but it's also fun to look at, I really haven't yet found it in me to care. This is a very polished showing from a team who frequently outdoes Nintendo at animating their own characters, and yet another fantastic demonstration of how much character-based variety you can pack into a list of actions shared by a big cast. Phenomenal work, as always. But there is still one more game that deserves recognition this year, and that game is Potionomics. This indie gem has been charming a lot of people, and for good reason. These characters are delightful, and the level of animation fidelity, personality, and sheer expressive appeal they are delivering in considerable quantities is pretty incredible coming from this small of a team. Making great animation for games, at any scale, is always an art of delivering the most bang for your buck, of prioritizing where to spend your limited budget for maximum impact. Or put another way, Making great game animation means finding ways to strategically constrain scope so you can avoid wasting resources needlessly. And this game is very good at optimizing its bang per buck and making every animation count. The way they present conversation exchanges using a library of looping emotion poses, basically a more animated version of Persona character portraits. The way they carefully stage every scene so the animators can focus on tuning each pose to a single camera angle. 
the way they have characters pop into a lively gesture as a means to transition from one pose to the next, rather than creating a thousand bespoke transitional animations from every pose to every other pose. There's just a lot of smart decisions here, and the results speak for themselves. This game is a joy to look at and just a treat in general. Huge props to everybody at Voracious Games. You've already made me love every character you've introduced me to, and I'm excited to see where you go from here. But I think that is finally all of them. Were there any games I missed? Obviously not. I was testing you. Like I said, I saw every game. But if you do still wish to argue a case for the animation of some other 2022 game, you may formally submit your appeals in the comment section below. Now, if anybody needs me, I have like four videos in progress that need finishing, so I'm gonna go and... yeah. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have a lovely 2023. See you next time!